Hello, everybody. This is Nanette Kennedy um, calling or calling, calling together the book club um, for Sunday, December 10th. And we are reading Conversations with God, Book Four Awaken the Species by Neil Donald Walsh. And we are on Chapter 27. And without further ado, Linda, if you'd like to begin to read. So this is Neil speaking. Is it possible for me to understand in layman's terms the metaphysics of all that we've been discussing? Yes, it is. The question is whether you have the patience for it and the interest in it. It can be helpful to you in expanding your understanding of yourself, your multidimensional universe, and even God. But it could feel like a bit like a postgraduate class here for a moment. Go, I'm all ears. Simply consider this. Life everywhere is composed of far more space than matter. This is easily observable with either a microscope or a telescope. Not surprisingly, the universe and a grain of sand look exactly the same, depending on the degree of the sand's magnification. The macrocosm and the microcosm are essentially identical. Now, when pure energy, the primal expression of life that we will call the essential essence, coagulates, it transforms into what would be called in human terms, matter. Because these coagulations are vibrating or vacillating at a sufficient speed, the particles constantly move. They not only vibrate or rotate in place, but they also move through space propelled by, an energy of the, by the energy of their spin, not unlike a top moving across a table as it spins. So these countless particles can move so fast in relative terms that they appear to be neither here nor there, but everywhere at once, thus creating the illusion of solidity, or what you would call that which is physical. You can watch the blades of a fan or the spokes of a bicycle wheel producing exactly the same illusion, the illusion of solidity. I've got it. So you're saying that simply by reducing the vibratory frequency or speed of their essential essence, heaps from another planet desolidify or disembody. That's right. All they've done is dramatically slow the spin of their energy particles, thus expanding the time it takes for those particles to get from one point to another in their vibratory pattern. You suddenly see the space between the particles, even as you would see the space between the spokes of a bicycle if the power that's spinning it is turned down. By the way, Take a look at the universe or any of its galaxies from a great enough distance, and all you will see is a big wheel. Now, should the space between the spokes of a bicycle wheel be sufficiently enormous, as if it would feel to you as if you were the size of a microbe and your perspective was therefore myopic, all you would see for a very long time until the next spoke of the wheel came by is empty space. In effect, while you're waiting and watching for the next spoke, the solidity will appear to have disappeared. What you do not know is that it was never there to begin with. It was merely the speed of the spokes moving past your line of sight that created the illusion of solidity. When a highly evolved being dephysicalizes, the time between the heap's energy cycles is so long in relative terms that the space between its vacillations is also in relative terms enormous. And what once appeared to others as a solid pattern form no longer has that appearance. The entity seems to have disappeared as it cannot be seen in its entirety unless viewed from a huge, to you, unfathomable distance. The formula is simple. 
time plus space equals appearance. If you could stand back far enough from the entire universe and the universe of universes, you would see the body of God. So what physicists are now conjecturing about is true, that there's more than one universe? Yes, the cosmos is a multiverse, not a universe. So to use a well-worn turn of phrase, we don't know the half of it. To be more accurate and perhaps coin a new phrase, you don't know the one hundredth of it. But highly evolved beings from another dimension understand the metaphysics of existence perfectly and are therefore are clear that they neither exist nor cease to exist simply because of the frequency rate of their energetic vibration. They merely appear to be or not be physical. To be or not to be, that is the question. Precisely. Heaps know that they always exist and forever as vibratory individuations of the essential essence and that all they are doing is regulating the functions of their energy, altering their vacillations to become seen or not seen, visible or not visible, what you would call physical or non-physical as it suits their purpose. How simple. They never really embody or disembody. They simply always are. They always are both. And they fill more or less space, in a sense, expanding or contracting themselves by merely altering the speed of their energetic vibration. And God is so huge because of your energetic vibration that you can't be seen at all. That doesn't mean you're not there. It just means that you're so expanded that the space between your energy particles makes you invisible. Brilliant. You got it. A metaphysical explanation of God. You and everything are the energy particles of God. And a huge space between the giant spinning particles of the cosmos is mirrored in the huge space in relative terms between the particles of which you are comprised. You do understand, yes, that if you look at your own body underneath enormous magnification, you will see what you will see is exactly what you would see when you look up at the night sky. You would see that both you and the cosmos are 99% space. Do you imagine this similarity to be a coincidence? If you took the air out of every person on earth and left only their energy particles, the entire human race would fit into a child's marvel. This is mind boggling and very helpful to understand. Most humans think of themselves as what they see and experience when their energy particles are moving at top speed. You think you're a body rather than a soul creating a body through a simple metaphysical manipulation. When a person's energy particles are moving at top speed, you say that person is living. And when their energy is moving at a very slow speed, you say that they have died. Yet death does not exist. You never cease to be, you simply change form. Actually, when you die, you become more expansive. So I never dephysicalize. I'm always a conglomeration of energy particles and I never cease to be that? That's what you mean when you say that death does not exist? Whether I'm physical or metaphysical is simply a matter of how expanded is the time that it takes for the particles I am to spin? Of how far apart on the space-time continuum my particles are? And this is simply a function of the speed at which they rotate and thus move around each other? You see? You asked if you could understand in layman terms all of this. And I said, yes, and you have. But my body continues to exist in physicality when the soul departs. It's either buried or cremated or in some other way disposed of. But it doesn't just disappear. No, 
it simply ceases to exist in its present physical form. Eventually, it dissipates. But it seems to me it's more integrated on the planet. My dead body eventually decomposes and become a, becomes a part of a larger composition of Earth in which it is buried. Or if it was cremated, changes form instantly into the dust of which the Earth and the cosmos is made. But it doesn't disintegrate. That's correct. The body that you have does not disintegrate. It reintegrates. It, it eventually becomes so fully integrated with the physicality around it that it ironically seems to disappear. It actually does not disappear at all. It, is a, it has actually not disappeared at all, but taken on a new appearance. It now appears to be melded into or one with the stuff of which everything is made. Ashes and ashes, ashes to ashes, dust to dust. Exactly. And the particles are then gathered by the soul that inhabited that body and reunited with the mind and the spirit to become, once again, the three-part self. This is the resurrection of the body, of which much has been written. But that didn't ha doesn't happen instantly, as it does with highly evolved beings. That's my point. This process takes time. If you look at it within the framework of that illusion, yes. But looked at from another vantage point, the viewpoint of the soul, when in metaphysical form, it's happening all at once. The energetic expressions that you call your body and your mind travel with the soul, indeed are parts of the soul, through all eternity. What your mind, in its unlimited understanding, calls your body and mind are merely aspects of the soul's energy, vibrating at frequencies that can cause them to be experienced and expressed in particular ways. You are a three-part being, body, mind, and spirit, and you never ever are anything less or anything, you ever, ever are anything less or anything less or anything else. As you move from the metaphysical to the physical and back again, you simply disintegrate and reintegrate. Okay, hang on a second. My, my book just jumped. Okay. As you move from the metaphysical to the physical and back again, you simply disintegrate and reintegrate these aspects of who you are. To help you understand how, much, how such a thing is possible, think of what you call white light. It's actually a combination of lights of different wavelengths in the electromagnetic spectrum. If you send white light through a dispersive prism, you will see its spectral colors, which are its constituent parts. Now, think of the physicality as the prism of ultimate reality. When the soul passes through the prism into physicality, it breaks into its constituent parts, body, mind, and spirit. When it passes back through the prism the other way, or as human put it, it's when you pass away, the soul becomes one element again. That one element is you. Thank you. <clears throat> Somebody like to start the conversation? Well, I'll start just because it, I just finished reading it. Uh, and it just, it's like, oh, this totally explains it. I've had a hard time coming up with a way to explain cellular memory because the cells of our bodies contain all the memories of our previous incarnations. And I've never really been able to explain how, I just know it to be true, but I haven't ever had words for how to describe it. And that's what he just described here. Is cell is it, it explains what cellular memory is. I think I've mentioned to this group before there's a guy in Florida by the name of Alan Mesher whose gift is to help heal people by uh, regressing them into previous lives where they've had physical traumas 
and by clearing the physical trauma in the other lifetime, the pain and discomfort in this lifetime goes away. And I'm a recipient of that healing. I've had that healing from him three times on three different things. And um, so I know it to be true. My personal experience is it's true. So I just, this, this is a, an incredibly powerful chapter. Over. Um, I was just wondering, I, I lost it a little bit in this chapter, but this last bit about um, being in a different body. So do we then choose a body to embody, if you see what I mean? Is that what he's saying here? Does anybody know? Um, did say it again? It, did we choose? Well, Is that what you said? Yeah. Like the prison, we're diff we 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 have different bodies. We we pass and then we enter or become a different body because we are always a body, mind, and soul. Um. So when we pass, our physical body passes. So we retain our soul because we are one soul, and our mind. What about our mind? What happens then to the mind? And do we choose a body to inhabit? I'm a bit sort of lost, quite, not, don't quite understand it over. You know, oh, you know what helps me with that, Angela? Is there's a, and oh my God, I hope I express this right. If not, put it through your beautiful channels and express it better for me with me ah. as much as we just exquisitely deliciously delight in this truth in this preciously clear to us way of explaining it god our best friend need i say that no but i did anyway from mr poet in me so Basically, God says there is a level of this intellectual understanding, <sighs> big breath, that we don't even have to amp on heaven, right? I mean, if, if we get different intellectual understandings, pull the F four letter word ends with K, two letters in between, over to you. No, but anyway, you know, holy goodness, golly gee is gosh. So I'm not going to intricately individually specifically detailedly understand every bit in words the workings of the universe the workings of the cosmos now we're into a cosmos made up of multi universes wow 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 okay i'm going to edit myself here does that make any sense angela kind of summing up i don't have to understand it all all that comes to me intellectually mind wise is awesome and there's a lot they say the sky is the limit i say why but anyway you know we don't have to intricately intellectually understand every blessed detail and still feel the bliss still feel the presence still feel the love i hope i didn't go on too long thank you bless you older like yeah thanks alton i didn't quite hear all that i do have a, a hearing problem so i didn't catch everything you said but yeah we don't need to um understand everything obviously thank you um angela you know one thing i wanted to say because i've said this over so many times in my life um, I'm going to use a big example and a little example every time I get on an airplane I start to wonder how does this thing work I mean how I mean you could explain it to me scientifically but because I don't have a big background in science that probably wouldn't answer my question but I have faith that it is going to take off and stay in the air um, and I my little example is, is I don't understand every little nuance of my vacuum cleaner but I still use it and I it, I think we'd probably all drive ourselves insane if we were always saying I'm not sure I get that because this chapter was a little tough for me too and I and I, I'm definitely going to reread it. And I mean, some things, one metaphor on page 170, where God says you can watch the blades of a fan or the spokes of a bicycle wheel producing exactly the same 
illusion, the illusion of sol solidity. And that to me is a telling business because we all know that if we stuck our hands in the fan, we'd realize it's, it's, it's a moving apparatus. I don't know if that helps at all. Over. Yes, thanks for that. Um, that does help. I, I mean, me too, about the airplane. I don't understand. It's a lot, and electricity as well. That boggle. <laughs> no, I just don't understand that at all. But um, uh, what was I going to say? I forgot now what I was going to say. Oh, yeah, I was just thinking that perhaps I'd missed something there. That's why I asked the question. Like I said, I think it's worth reading again, for me anyway. Yeah, me too, definitely. Should we do that now? Anybody else interested? I, I'm in. That's I'm all. very interested. Yeah. Sure. Okay. Whenever, does anybody have anything else they want to say before we start that again? Wow. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> wow. All right. I'm going to mute myself. Awesome. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Okay. Let's see. Make sure I'm not on mute. All right. So this is chapter seven, replay. Neil speaking. Is it possible for me to understand in layman's terms the metaphysics of all that we've been discussing? Yes, it is. The question is whether you have the patience for it and the interest in it. It can be helpful for you in expanding your understanding of yourself, your multidimensional universe, and even God, but it could feel a bit like a postgraduate class here for a moment. Go, I'm all ears. Simply consider this. Life everywhere is composed of far more space than matter. This is easily observable with either a microscope or a telescope. Not surprisingly, the universe and a grain of sand look exactly the same, depending on the degree of the sand's magnification. The macrocosm and the microcosm are essentially identical. Now, when pure energy, the primal expression of life that we call the essential essence, coagulates, it transforms into what would be called, in human terms, matter. Because these coagulations are vibrating or vacillating at a sufficient speed, the particles constantly move. They not only vibrate or rotate in space, but they also move through space, propelled by en the energy of their spin, not unlike a top moving across a table as it spins. These countless particles can move so fast in relative terms that they appear to be neither here nor there but everywhere at once, thus creating the illusion of solidity, or what you would call that which is physical. You can watch the blades of a fan or the spokes of a bicycle producing exactly the same illusion, illusion, the illusion of solidity. Okay, I got it. So you're saying that by simply reducing the vibratory frequency or speed of their essential essence, heaves from another dimension, desolidify or disembody. That's right. All that they've done is to dramatically slow the spin of their energy particles, thus expanding the time it takes for those particles to get from one point to another in their vibratory pattern. You suddenly see the space between the particles, even as you would see the space between the spokes of a bicycle wheel if the power that's spinning it is turned down. By the way, take a look at the universe or any of its galaxies from a great enough distance and you will see a big wheel. Now, should the space between the spokes of a bicycle wheel be sufficiently enormous as it would feel to you if you were the size of a microbe and your perspective was therefore myopic, all you would see for a long time, very long time, until the spoke of the next wheel came by, is empty space. In effect, while you are waiting and watching for the next spoke, the solidity will appear to have disappeared. What you do not know is that it was never there to begin with. 
It was merely the speed of the spokes moving past your line of sight that created the illusion of solidity. When a highly evolved being dephysicalizes, the time between the heaves energy cycles is so long in relative terms that the space between the vacillations, also in relative terms, is enormous. And what once appeared to others as a solid physical form no longer has that appearance. The entity seems to have disappeared as it cannot be seen in its entirety unless viewed from a huge to you unfathomable distance. The formula is simple, time plus space equals appearance. If you could stand back far enough from the entire universe and the universe of universes, you would see the body of God. So what physics are now conjecturing about is true, that there is more than one universe? Yes, the cosmos is a multiverse, not a universe. So to use a well-worn turn of phrase, we don't know the half of it. <laughs> to be more accurate and perhaps coin a new phrase, you don't know the 100th of it. But highly evolved beings from another dimension understand the metaphysics of existence perfectly and therefore are clear that they neither exist nor cease to exist simply because of the frequency of their energetic vibration. They merely appear to be or not be physical. To be or not be, that is the question, precisely. Hebes know that they exist always and forever as vibratory individuations of the essential essence, and that they all are doing, and that all they are doing is regulating the fluctuations of their energy, altering their vacillations to become seen or not seen, visible or not visible, what you would call physical or non-physical as it suits their purpose. How simple. They never really embody or disembody. They simply always are. They always are both. And they fill more or less space, in a sense, expanding or contracting themselves by merely altering the speed of their energetic vibration. And God is so huge because of your energetic vibration that you can't be seen at all. That doesn't mean you're not there. It just means that you're so expanded that the space between your energy particles makes you invisible. Brilliant. You've got it. A metaphysical explanation of God. You and everything are the energy particles of God. And the huge space between the giant spinning particles of the cosmos is mirrored in the huge space in relative terms between the particles of which you are comprised. You do understand, yes, that if you look at your own body beneath enormous magnification, what you will see is exactly what you see when you look up at the night sky. You would see that both you and the cosmos are 99% space. Do you imagine the similarity to be a coincidence? If you, look, if you took the air out of every single person on Earth and left only their energy particles, the entire human race would fit into a child's marvel. This is mind-boggling. And very helpful to understand. Most humans think of themselves as what they see and experience when their energy particles are moving at top speed. You think you are a body rather than a soul, creating a body through a simple metaphysical manipulation. When a person's energy particles are moving at top speed, you say that person is living. And when their energy is moving at very slow speed, you say that they have died. Yet that does not exist. You never cease to be. You simply change form. Actually, when you die, you become more expansive. So I never dephysicalize. I'm always a conglomeration of energy particles, and I never cease to be that. That's what you mean when you say death does not exist? Whether I'm physical or metaphysical is simply a matter of how expanded is the time that it takes 
for the particles I am to spin, of how far apart on the space-time continuum my particles are. And this is simply a function of the speed at which they rotate and thus move around each other. You see, you asked if you could understand in layman terms all of this, and I said yes, and you have. But my body continues to exist in physicality when the soul departs. It's either buried or cremated or in some other way disposed of, but it doesn't just disappear. No, it simply ceases to exist in its present physical form. Eventually, it dissipates. But it seems to me that it's more integrated with the planet. My dead body eventually decomposes and becomes a part of the larger composition of Earth in, in which it is buried. Or if it's cremated, it changes instantly into the dust of the Earth and the cosmos that it's made of. But it doesn't disintegrate. Well, if that's correct. The body you have does not disintegrate, it reintegrates. It eventually becomes so fully integrated with the physicality around it that it ironically seems to disappear. It actually does not, has not disappeared at all, but taken on a new appearance. It now appears to be melded into or one with the stuff of which everything is made. So ashes to ashes, dust to dust. Exactly. And the particles are then gathered by the soul that inhabited that body and reunited with the mind and spirit to become once again the three-part self. This is the resurrection of the body of which much has been written. But that doesn't happen instantly as it does with highly evolved beings. That's my point. This process takes time. If you look within the framework of that illusion, yes, but looked at from another vantage point, the viewpoint of the soul, when in metaphysical form, is it's all happening at once. The energetic expressions that you call your body and your mind travel with the soul, indeed are parts of the soul, through all eternity. What your mind in its limited understanding calls body and mind are merely aspects of the soul's energy vibrating at frequencies that cause them to be experienced and expressed in particular ways you are a three-part being body mind and spirit and you never ever are anything less or anything else as you move from the metaphysical to the physical and back again you simply disintegrate and reintegrate these aspects of who you are. To help you understand how such a thing is possible, think of what you call white light. It's actually a combination of lights of different wavelengths in the electromagnetic spectrum. If you send white light through a dispersive prism, you will see its spectral colors, which are its constituent parts. Now think of physicality as the prism of ultimate reality. When the soul passes through the prism into physicality, it breaks into its constituent parts, body, mind, and spirit. When it passes back through the prism the other way, or as humans put it, when you pass away, the soul becomes one element again. That one element is you. Thank you. <clears throat> Questions? Or comments? Well, I am reluctant to call myself a highly evolved being, but, <laughs> when, he, but, but when he describes this process, as many of you know, uh, you know, I was born awake. I was born knowing that I came here to do something. I was born with this understanding that what we see is not all there is. And, and so um, some of what he says here sort of explains s that experience at, at some level to me.
may I be granted the opportunity to call all of you on this call highly evolved beings? I mean, I know it's contextual, la la la, but you are, you're awesome. You're goddesses. Over. <laughs> well, rumor has it that highly evolved uh, beings are getting new angels. I heard it through the grapevine. <laughs> We're all getting new angels. <laughs> um, I think I, I'm going to have to read this a third time. And no, we don't have to read it a third time here. Um, because one of the things I kept thinking about through this chapter, and I feel like I'm in an AA meeting. I'm going to share a secret with you guys. Um, I believe in ghosts, and I do ghost hunting. And I think... I kept thinking about this with the integration of energy and when things appear or when things happen. Um, I keep getting pulled in that direction. Uh, and it also makes me question why not everybody I ask to appear like my parents, although they do some strange things like I believe they move things around or they do a walk on in a dream. Um, I'm just going to leave that there because I, I do keep getting distracted by my thing with ghosts. Over. I believe that's wonderfully courageous. You know what I mean? Get ego and intellect out of the way. Oh my goodness. Now I'm challenging myself to admit something vulnerable <laughs> about me. <laughs> that's okay. We're all one. Hey, how's that for vulnerable? Yeah, there you I go. Yeah, here we are. There you go. I love that what you just said, Nanette. Yeah, I'm interested in that, too. It's all very real. Uh, I, ex yeah, no, well, I'll leave it for somebody else to share what they have to say. But you have my support in that aspect of understanding being, right? I've done some of that stuff, too. I'm questioning what levels of technology are helpful compared to what levels of intuition and, you know. I could tell a story, for example, uh, I had a dear friend many years ago, and uh, it was uh, some of the most extreme drama that you can come across in life, right? He was in a car in front of his mom, a convertible, a little, you know, little one, and she watched him T-boned and flipping, and he died. And, of course, it was one of the most traumatic things that could ever happen to anybody. Right. Uh, not for him, apparently. He had two younger, uh, he had a younger brother and a younger sister. And he appeared to them in his spirit, in his visions, in his energy. They were open and hadn't been closed down by societal, uh, you know, conditioning that this stuff isn't real, blah, 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 blah. blah. He, his brother and sister could see him in his spirit form, hear him, but his mom denied this truth so uh, well, to be honest, if I would have been deeper in my appreciation and understanding, I could have helped guide them more through that at the time, but I was barely 20-something myself and didn't understand all of it all that well. I did my best, obviously. But anyway, yeah, you can. how can we see ghosts? How can we experience ghosts and recognize that we are ghosts? Over. Yeah, I don't know, but I know that ghosts are real because I've I've had personal experiences, um, and I think you know the way that it, I explain that is that it's all just energy. You know, if if we could look at it at a different, we were at a different frequency, they wouldn't be ghosts; they'd actually be entities, because it's the same as everything else that he talks about in this chapter. You know, it's a matter of, it, it's just energy. I kind of like that thing that he said, that if you could get out far enough, you'd see a big wheel. That interests me. Getting out far enough to see the big wheel. How many wedges are there, 12? <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> I mean, you know. <laughs> um, reality, really, it's really reality. <laughs> You you've been <laughs> you've been made slightly acquainted of that I'm a poet type, so there you go. Over. Actually, now that as I'm processing this whole chapter, I think that. Right towards the end, he, he says something that basically would explain what a ghost is. You know, that, 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 the, that obviously the physical body can't go back into the soul, but the experience of the physical body goes back into the soul because that's what would explain memories of other physical bodies. Um, So someone dies and uh, they haven't reintegrated totally would be the explanation if I'm understanding this chapter right. They, they're in their spirit form, they're in the form of their soul in that they're non-physical at that point. But even ghosts can do physical things. So I don't know. I have to read the chapter again too. <laughs> um, not entirely clear <laughs> well next week I want everybody to have a 10 page essay <laughs> on this chapter just kidding um, anybody else want to comment yeah yeah can we write our own chapter <laughs> yeah wow Victoria this is fun gone. thank you so much for sharing your essential selves ladies yeah, Victoria in British Columbia has a lot of ghosts and there are regular ghost walks that, um, you know, take you to the places where ghosts are in Victoria and it's, it's kind of fun to go on a ghost walk. Yeah, yeah. that would be great for the Global Council meeting. Um, we could do that. I mean, <laughs> really, but... I mean, um, those who were interested. Yeah. Well, and I, I think it was Alton that said something about, and I was really careful with my kids when they were young. I didn't try to say, no, you didn't see that, or that's impossible. I was very open and very listening. And I'm sure I've told this story before, but my youngest son, Casey, was a twin. And his twin didn't make it full term. And... I didn't mention this to Casey until I thought he was old enough to understand. You know, I didn't want to, I just didn't want to put it out there. But he put it out there to me when he was about three. He's just, he was in the backseat of the car. And he always did it in the backseat of the car. And I always felt like I was going to have a car accident. But he'd say, Mom, I'm always missing somebody. There's somebody that's not with me, that's supposed to be with me. Um, and then uh, my granddaughter, who I adopted her mother, so there's not even a blood connection, but she knew who my mother was because my mother had already crossed over and would tell me little, little stories, just little tidbits about my mom. And I would be like, I didn't say it, but I was thinking, how do you know that? You know, and my daughter wouldn't have even been old enough to remember some of the things. So there there's something to it in my opinion over right it's all just energy and the physicality of it is an illusion well so, it goes to we are one exactly 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 we all could tell you something about your mother if we were tapped into it i mean that's that's the fact of it. That's what um, he calls all knowing, right? You're all knowing and you already maybe previously did it in a past life or something and then you get the feelings like 
I've been here before or that kind of thing. The deja vu. Yeah, all that. Synchronicities, all that. Yeah. Well, and, and then it becomes very difficult. I'm always the one that brings this back in, but to to wrap your head around the idea that there's no such thing as time. Right. That, that while we're experiencing all of this in a very linear fashion, mm -hmm. it ultimately is not how it's working. Yeah. Not with the consciousness shift as well. Right. Really shifting big time right now. Because there's problems. Well, but it's already shifted. If there's no such thing as time, right. it's, it's already shifted. Correct. Well, and imagine if we took every word in our language, no matter what language you speak, that had anything to do with the measurement of time, mm -hmm. how much that wouldn't even play into our field of yeah. consciousness or resonance. I mean, it would still be because we're pretty programmed. But if we removed, you know, anything like sun up, sun down, anytime, now, here, then, when, it'd be hard to read a book, I can tell you that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> what is going on here? Um, anyway, that's just two cents worth. Anybody else? Well, I have a retort to um, Linda. Uh-oh. <laughs> yeah, we're competing here, Linda. You, you woke up, uh, you, you uh, were born awake, right? Mm -hmm. We were all born asleep, and we've been falling deeper down that hole. <laughs> Every one of us, like my brother and sister were here. And I was thinking, wow, like, <laughs> you know? Okay, Shabana, are we talking collective consciousness of humanity falling into a deeper hole according to what I'm assuming is your take on it? Or are we talking about individual consciousness? ever rising and growing and expanding and all that good stuff because i see that in you and everybody here over you you see what in me Infinity, light love i see the fact that your individual consciousness is growing and evolving although the collective consciousness of humanity which pulls us along with them up to a point, only the point we allow somehow with, the, with God's help, right? Uh, we get dragged along by the... So when you're saying that you're thinking that we're falling deeper into a hole, are you talking about the collective humanity or are you talking about you individually, personally? And I've already answered that one for me because you individually, personally are growing and evolving, but there's such a pull from what's going on in Earth on our collective consciousness and our individual consciousness, don't you think? Over. Uh, what I was um, referring to was me personally, being absolutely certain I'm a body. Like, that's all I am, thank you, you know? And um, with my brother and sister, they discussed my situation and you know they had ways to help me um legally and every other way right so what i'm saying is that we weren't exactly discussing love heals all it was we're having a war thank you so all I'm saying is that we're all bodies here and Linda was born awake, but we're not. And I'm following them up on it. <laughs> You're muted. I didn't say anything. I was just no, laughing. Not, no, I was, not, I, I was talking, but I was, didn't have my mute off. 
I was just going to say, you know, that might be a good exercise for all of us over the next week is to make a mental note or physical note, which in my case would have to be physical. Yeah, me too. Um, or I would forget <laughs> it. Uh, of those moments where we feel like we are really awake and then those moments where we kind of feel like, wake up, don't go back to sleep. Um, but I think that might be a good exercise just for our own awareness. Hmm. Yeah, you know. That's a good idea. How come I didn't think of that? Because <laughs> <laughs> you're not in the net. <laughs> or are well, you? In oneness, you did, Shibana. Yeah, in oneness, you did. Um, Shibana, you want to close us out with a like a minute long oneness moment? Oneness moment. You bet. I've, I've forgotten about that one. Okay, here we are. Almighty God, I'm sliding backward, and it's so easy to do. Pull us all out of the hole. Amen. Thank Amen. you, Shabana. Thank yep. you, Shabana. Thank you. All right, until next weekend, uh, let's all just keep our awake thinking caps on. Love you all. Bye, bye everyone. Bye, Love Angela. Bye, bye, Christine. Bye, bye. Alton. Bye, Linda. Yeah. Feel like the bye. Brady Bunch. Bye, Kirsten. There you go. <laughs> 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 bye. You're saying it right. <laughs> <laughs> really. <laughs>